Be sure to hop on over to the Spiritual Broadcast Network. It's the go-to place for all things spiritual. You'll discover internet television shows that you won't find anywhere else. You can also choose from hundreds of hours of spiritual documentaries and movies. You'll enjoy on-demand and live internet television programming 24-7. Best of all, we add new dramas, comedies, talk, and reality shows, and more on a daily basis. So why spend countless hours searching the web when you can quickly find just what you want on the Spiritual Broadcast Network? Wisdom Through Action is a contemporary, sea-influenced school teaching the work of personal inner development in the system brought to the Western world by G.I. Gurdjieff and P.D. Ospensky. Mr. Ospensky said, The most important ideas and principles of this system do not belong to me. This is chiefly what makes them valuable, because if they belonged to me, they would be like all other theories invented by ordinary minds. What he meant was that this system comes from higher mind, from conscious influence. It is an objective system to bring a man to awakening. Welcome to Wisdom Through Action. I'm your host, Kay Smith. This is our 17th show here on SBN. And if you've been following along, I imagine that your interest is quite piqued and you may be ready to start studying. And if for some reason you've missed any of our previous 16 shows, they're quite easy to find if you go to our website, which is wisdomthroughaction.org. And they're listed there on the website. And you may be wondering, how do I start? I don't live in Florida. What do I do? Well, we are having meetings via Skype. And so it's quite simple to, to start. You want to start the work? send me an email. I can be reached at k k a y 321 at verizon.net. Let me know what your interest is, and we'll go from there. Now, I wish to remind you today that this system is based on understanding. Mr. Gurdjieff says that understanding must occupy the first place in this system. The more you understand, the better the result of your work will be. And understanding is a relative term. Everyone understands something at every moment in his or her own way, but understanding may be larger and larger and still larger. In this system, we call understanding a certain possible maximum on a certain level of knowledge and being. As a rule, this maximum is too low. People's understanding is usually limited to only one room, and they never get out of that room. But the understanding of these ideas is very much beyond this one room. As you should recall from previous shows, this work refers to mechanical man as a machine. In order to go from machine to a real man or woman requires a great deal of increase in one's understanding. The following is a 30-minute video regarding Gurdjieff's concept of our machine being a food factory. The human mechanism is designed to produce a very large output of energy by transforming coarse matters into finer ones. In normal life circumstances, the output of energy never reaches its full potential. The human organism is sustained by three kinds of food, physical food, air, and impressions. The two processes by which this food is transformed, first automatically to stay alive, second consciously to fulfill our potential. The three-story food factory human body. Three stories of the head. We want to do, but in everything we do, We are tied and limited by the amount of energy produced by our organism. Every function, every state, every action, every thought, every emotion requires a certain definite energy, a certain definite substance. We come to the conclusion that we must remember ourselves but we can remember ourselves only if we have in us the energy for self-remembering. 
We can study something, understand or feel something, only if we have the energy for understanding, feeling, or studying. What then is a person to do when they begin to realize that they do not have enough energy to attain the aims they have set before themselves? The answer to this is that every normal man has quite enough energy to begin work on himself. It is only necessary to learn how to save the greater part of the energy we possess for useful work instead of wasting it unproductively. Energy is spent chiefly on unnecessary and unpleasant emotions, on the expectation of unpleasant things, possible and impossible, on bad moods, on unnecessary haste, nervousness, irritability, imagination, daydreaming, and so on. Energy is wasted on the wrong work of centers, on unnecessary tension of the muscles out of all proportion to the work produced, on perpetual chatter, which absorbs an enormous amount of energy, on the interest continually taken in things happening around us or to other people, and having in fact no interest whatever, on the constant waste of the force of attention, and so on and so on. In beginning to struggle with all these habitual sides of his life, a man saves an enormous amount of energy, and with the help of this energy, he can easily begin the work of self-study and self-perfection. Further on, however, the problem becomes more difficult. Having to a certain extent balanced his machine and ascertained for himself that it produces much more energy than he expected, a man nevertheless comes to the conclusion that this energy is not enough, and that if he wishes to continue his work, he must increase the amount of energy produced. The study of the working of the human organism shows this to be quite possible. The human organism represents a chemical factory planned for the possibility of a very large output. But in the ordinary conditions of life, the output of this factory never reaches the full production possible to it, because only a small part of the machinery is used which produces only that quantity of material necessary to maintain its own existence. Factory work of this kind is obviously uneconomic in the highest degree. The factory actually produces nothing. All its machinery, all its elaborate equipment, actually serves no purpose at all in that it maintains only with difficulty its own existence. The work of the factory consists in transforming one kind of matter into another, namely the coarser matters, in the cosmic sense, into finer ones. The factory receives as raw material from the outer world a number of coarse hydrogens and transforms them into finer hydrogens by means of a whole series of complicated alchemical processes. But in the ordinary conditions of life, the production by the human factory of the finer hydrogens, in which, from the point of view of the possibility of higher states of consciousness and the work of higher centers, we are particularly interested, is insufficient, and they are all wasted on the existence of the factory itself. If we could succeed in bringing the production up to its possible maximum, we should then begin to save the fine hydrogens. Then the whole of the body, all the tissues, all the cells, would become saturated with these fine hydrogens, which would gradually settle in them, crystallizing in a special way. This crystallization of the fine hydrogens would gradually bring the whole organism onto a higher level, onto a higher plane of being. This, however, cannot happen in the ordinary conditions of life because the factory expends all that it produces. Learn to separate the fine from the coarse. 
This principle, from the emerald tablets of Hermes Trimagistus, refers to the work of the human factory, and if a man learns to separate the fine from the coarse, that is, if he brings the production of the fine hydrogens to its possible maximum, he will by this very fact create for himself the possibility of an inner growth which can be brought about by no other means. Inner growth, the growth of the inner bodies of man, the astral, the mental, and so on, is a material process completely analogous to the growth of the physical body. All the substances necessary for the maintenance of the life of the organism, for psychic work, for the higher functions of consciousness and the growth of the higher bodies, are produced by the organism from the food which enters it from outside. The human organism receives three kinds of food. One, the ordinary food we eat. Two, the air we breathe and three, our impressions. It is not difficult to agree that air is a kind of food for the organism, but in what way impressions can be food may appear at first difficult to understand. We must, however, remember with every external impression, whether it takes the form of sound or vision or smell, we receive from outside a certain amount of energy, a certain number of vibrations. This energy which enters the organism from outside is food. Moreover, as has been said before, energy cannot be transmitted without matter. If an external impression brings external energy with it into the organism, it means that external matter also enters which feeds the organism in the full meaning of the term. For its normal existence the organism must receive all three kinds of food, that is, physical food, air, and impressions. The organism cannot exist on one or even on two kinds of food. All three are required. But the relation of these foods to one another and their significance for the organism is not the same. The organism can exist for a comparatively long time without a supply of fresh physical food. Cases of starvation are known lasting for over 60 days when the organism lost none of its vitality and recovered very quickly as soon as it began to take food. Of course, starvation of this kind cannot be considered as complete, since in all cases of such artificial starvation, people have taken water. Nevertheless, even without water, a man can live without food for several days. Without air, he can exist only for a few minutes, not more than two or three. As a rule, a man dies after being four minutes without air. Without impressions, a man cannot live a single moment. If the flow of impressions were to be stopped in some way, or if the organism were deprived of its capacity for receiving impressions, it would immediately die. The flow of impressions coming to us from outside is like a driving belt communicating motion to us. The principal motor for us is nature, the surrounding world. Nature transmits to us through our impressions the energy by which we live and move and have our being. If the inflow of this energy is arrested, our machine will immediately stop working. Thus, of the three kinds of food the most important for us is impressions, although it stands to reason that a man cannot exist for long on impressions alone. Impressions and air enable a man to exist a little longer. Impressions, air, and physical food enable the organism to live to the end of its normal term of life and to produce the substances necessary not only for the maintenance of life, 
but also for the creation and growth of higher bodies. The process of transforming the substances which enter the organism into finer ones is governed by the law of octaves. Let us take the human organism in the form of a three-story factory or house. The upper floor of this factory or house consists of a man's head, the middle floor of the chest, and the lower of the stomach, back, and the lower part of the body. Physical food is H768, or La Sol Fa, of the third cosmic octave of radiations. This hydrogen enters the lower story of the organism as oxygen, Do 768. Entering the mouth, food, H768, submits to the masticating action of the jaws combined with the liquefying action of saliva. The beginning of the digestion of food, H768, in the organism. Note, carbons which are present in the organism are marked. The circle with short radiating lines out from the circle. The food and saliva then enter the stomach where it meets with and is broken down by enzymes and gastric juices, carbon-192, which unlock the heavy food molecules and produce a nutrient liquid called chyme, Ray-384. Ray-384, which becomes oxygen in the next triad, meets with carbon-96 in the organism and together with it produces a new nitrogen-192, which is the note Mi-192. Chime, Ray-384, then meets with bile and other active secretions of the liver, carbon-96, which produces a liquid sufficiently refined to be absorbed through the walls of the bowels into the venous blood. Me 192. As it is known from the law of octaves, me cannot pass independently into fa in an ascending octave. An additional shock is necessary. If an additional shock is not received, the substance me 192 cannot by itself pass into the full note fa. At the given place in the organism, where Mi-192 ought, apparently, to come to a stop, there enters the second food, air, in the form of Do-192, that is, Mi-Re-Do of the second cosmic octave of radiations. The note Do possesses all the necessary semitones, that is, all the energy necessary for the transition to the next note, and it gives, as it were, a part of its energy to the note Mi, which has the same density as itself. The energy of Do gives Mi 192 force enough, while uniting with carbon 48 already in the organism, to pass into nitrogen 96. Nitrogen 96 will be the note Fa. The venous blood, Mi 192, is exposed over the large surface of the lungs to air, Do-192, and is vitalized by the oxygen and emerges as arterial blood, Fa-96. Fa-96, by uniting with carbon-24 present in the organism, passes into nitrogen-48, the note Sol. Arterial blood, Fa-96, goes to the head, the brain, where it is acted upon by a certain principle, carbon-24, which activates it to the point where it can induce electric or nervous reactions in the cerebral cortex, producing thoughts, Sol-48. The note Sol-48, by uniting with carbon-12 present in the organism, passes into nitrogen-24, La-24. Thoughts, Sol-48, being refined still further by meaning with carbon-12, attitude, motivation, in the head, 
becomes the fuel of the nervous systems controlling on the one hand motor impulses and on the other involuntary inner workings of the body, that is, energy by which man moves and acts, will. Law 24. Law 24 unites with carbon-6 present in the organism and is transformed into nitrogen-12 or C12. C12 is the highest substance produced in the organism from physical food with the help of the additional shock obtained from the air. Will, Law 24, meets with desire, wish, aim, carbon-6, in the chest and is transformed into the extraordinarily subtle manifestations of energy which can be described physiologically in terms of the sex function, sex energy, C12, and is the source of the whole gamut of higher and creative emotions of which the human being is capable. Doe 192, air, entering the middle story of the factory in the character of oxygen and giving part of its energy to me 192, unites in its turn at a certain place with carbon 48 present in the organism and passes into ray 96. Ray 96 passes into me 48 with the help of carbon 24 and with this the development of the second octave comes to a stop. For the transition of me into fa, an additional shock is necessary, but at this point nature has not prepared any additional shock and the second octave, that is the air octave, cannot develop further and in the ordinary conditions of life it does not develop further. The third octave begins with Do 48. Impressions enter the organism in the form of oxygen 48, that is, La Sol Fa of the second cosmic octave, Sun Earth. Do 48 has sufficient energy to pass into the following note, but at that place in the organism where Do 48 enters, the carbon 12 necessary for this is not present. At the same time, Do 48 does not come into contact with Mi 48 so that it can neither itself pass into the next note nor give part of its energy to Mi 48. Under normal conditions, that is, the conditions of normal existence, the production of the fine matters by the factory at this point comes to a stop, and the third octave sounds as Do only. The highest substance produced by the factory is C12 and for all its higher functions the factory is able to use only this higher matter. The three kinds of food and the digestion of H768 and H192 in the organism with the help of one mechanical shock. The normal state of the organism and the normal production of finer substances from the products of nutrition. There is, however, a possibility of increasing the output, that is, of enabling the air octave and the impression octave to develop further. For this purpose, it is necessary to create a special kind of artificial shock at the point where the beginning of the third octave is arrested. This means that the artificial shock must be applied to the note Do 48. But what is meant by an artificial shock? It is connected with the moment of the reception of an impression. The note Do 48 designates the moment when an impression enters our consciousness. An artificial shock at this point means a certain kind of effort made at the moment of receiving an impression. It has been explained before that in ordinary conditions of life we do not remember ourselves. We do not remember, that is, we do not feel ourselves, are not aware of ourselves at the moment of a perception, of an emotion, of a thought, or of an action. If a man understands this, 
and tries to remember himself, every impression he receives while remembering himself will, so to speak, be doubled. In an ordinary psychic state I simply look at a street, but if I remember myself, I do not simply look at the street. I feel that I am looking, as though saying to myself, I am looking. Instead of one impression of the street, there are two impressions, one of the street and another of myself looking at it. This second impression, produced by the fact of my remembering myself, is the additional shock. Moreover, it very often happens that the additional sensation connected with self-remembering brings with it an element of emotion, that is, the work of the machine attracts a certain amount of carbon-12 to the place in question. Efforts to remember oneself, observation of oneself at the moment of receiving an impression, observation of one's impressions at the moment of receiving them, registering, so to speak, the reception of impressions and the simultaneous defining of the impressions received. All this, taken together, doubles the intensity of the impressions and carries Doe 48 to Ray 24. At the same time, the effort connected with the transition of one note to another and the passage of 48 itself to 24 enables Do 48 of the third octave to come into contact with Mi 48 of the second octave and to give this note the requisite amount of energy necessary for the transition of Mi to Fa 24. In this way, the shock given to Do 48 extends also to Mi 48 and enables the second octave to develop. Mi 48 passes to Fa 24, Fa 24 passes to Sol 12, Sol 12 passes to La 6, and La 6 is the highest matter produced by the organism from air, that is, from the second kind of food. This, however, is obtained only by making a conscious effort at the moment an impression is received. It is necessary to understand what this means. We all breathe the same air. Apart from the elements known to our science, the air contains a great number of substances unknown to science, indefinable for it and inaccessible to its observation. But exact analysis is possible both of the air inhaled and of the air exhaled. This exact analysis shows that although the air inhaled by different people is exactly the same, the air exhaled is quite different. Let us suppose that the air we breathe is composed of 20 different elements unknown to our science. A certain number of these elements are absorbed by every man when he breathes. Let us suppose that five of these elements are always absorbed. Consequently, the air exhaled by every man is composed of fifteen elements. Five of them have gone to feeding the organism. But some people exhale not fifteen, but only ten elements. That is to say, they absorb five elements more. These five elements are higher hydrogens. These higher hydrogens are present in every small particle of air we inhale. By inhaling air we introduce these higher hydrogens into ourselves, but if our organism does not know how to extract them out of the particles of air and retain them, they are exhaled back into the air. If the organism is able to extract and retain them, they remain in it. In this way, we all breathe the same air, but we extract different substances from it. Some extract more, others less. In order to extract more, 
It is necessary to have in our organism a certain quantity of corresponding fine substances. Then the fine substances contained in the organism act like a magnet on the fine substances contained in the inhaled air. We come again to the old alchemical law. In order to make gold, it is first of all necessary to have a certain quantity of real gold. If no gold whatever is possessed, there is no means whatever of making it. The whole of alchemy is nothing but an allegorical description of the human factory and its work of transforming base metals, coarse substances, into precious ones, fine substances. We have followed the development of two octaves. The third octave, that is, the octave of impressions, begins through a conscious effort. Doe 48 passes to Ray 24. Ray 24 passes to Me 12. At this point, the development of the octave comes to a stop. Now, if we examine the result of the development of these three octaves, we shall see that the first octave has reached C12, the second, La 6 and the third, Mi-12. Thus, the first and third octaves stop at notes which are unable to pass to the following notes. For the two octaves to develop further, a second conscious shock is needed at a certain point in the machine. A new conscious effort is necessary which will enable the two octaves to continue their development. The nature of this effort demands special study. From the point of view of the general work of the machine, it can be said in general that this effort is connected with the emotional life, that it is a special kind of influence over one's emotions. But what this kind of influence really is, and how it has to be produced, can be explained only in connection with a general description of the work of the human factory or the human machine. The practice of not expressing unpleasant emotions, of not identifying, of not considering inwardly, is the preparation for the second effort. If we now take the work of the human factory as a whole, we shall be able to see, at the moments when the production of fine substances is arrested, by what means we can increase the productivity of the factory. We see that, under ordinary conditions, and working with one mechanical shock, the factory produces a very small quantity of the fine substances, in fact, only C12. Working with one mechanical and one conscious shock, the factory now produces a much greater quantity of the fine substances. Working with two conscious shocks, the factory will produce a quantity of the fine substances such as, in the course of time, will completely change the character of the factory itself. The three-story factory represents the universe in miniature and is constructed according to the same laws and on the same plan as the whole universe. Remember, it is not necessary to add the conscious shocks discussed in the video if you are satisfied with your mechanical life. And nature brings us to a certain point in our development and then leaves us to develop further through our own will and effort. For this development to occur, we must increase the production of higher matters. And in order to do that, we must understand and know how to do it, not only theoretically, but in actual fact, because it needs a long time to learn how to use this knowledge and how to make right efforts. Gurdjieff, in his special language, wrote of man's situation in an allegory called The Two Rivers. In this allegory, we are the drops of water that are in one of two rivers, either passive or active. And this allegory that I'm going to read comes from Gurdjieff's book, Views from the Real World. So let me start. 
It will be useful if we compare human life in general to a large river which arises from various sources and flows into two separate streams. That is to say, there occurs in this river a dividing of the waters. And we can compare the life of any one man to one of the drops of water composing this river of life. On account of the unbecoming life of people, it was established for the purposes of the common actualizing of everything existing that in general, human life on the earth should flow in two streams. Great nature foresaw and gradually fixed in the common presence of humanity a corresponding property so that before the dividing of the waters in each drop that had has this corresponding inner subjective struggle with one's own denying part, there might arise that something, thanks to which certain properties are acquired, which give the possibility, at the place of the branching of the waters of life, of entering one or the other stream. Thus, there are two directions in the life of humanity, active and passive. Laws are the same everywhere. These two laws, these two currents, continually meet, now crossing each other, now running parallel. They never mix. They support each other. They are indispensable for each other. It was always so, and so it will remain. Now the life of all ordinary men, taken together, can be thought of as one of these rivers, in which each life, whether of a man or of any other living being, is represented by a drop in the river, and the river in itself is a link in the cosmic chain. In accordance with general cosmic laws, the river flows in a fixed direction. All its turns, all its bends, all these changes have a definite purpose. In this purpose, every drop plays a part insofar as it is part of the river. But the law of the river as a whole does not extend to the individual drops. The changes of position, movement, and direction of the drops are completely accidental. At one moment a drop is here, the next moment it is there. Now it is on the surface, now it has gone to the bottom. Accidentally it arises, accidentally it collides with another and descends, now it moves quickly, now slowly. Whether its life is easy or difficult depends on where it happens to be. There is no individual law for it, no personal fate. Only the river, only the whole river has a fate, which is common to all the drops. Personal sorrow and joy, happiness and suffering in that current, all these are accidental. But the drop has, in principle, a possibility of escaping from this general current and jumping across to the other, the neighboring stream. This, too, is a law of nature. But for this, the drop must know how to make use of accidental shocks and of the momentum of the whole river so as to come to the surface and be closer to the bank at those places where it is easier to jump across. It must choose not only the right place, but also the right time to make use of currents, winds, and storms. Then the drop has a chance to rise with the spray and jump across into the other river. From the moment it gets into the other river, the drop, remember that's us, is in a different world, in a different life, and therefore is under different laws. In the second river, a law exists for individual drops, the law of alternating progression. A drop comes to the top or goes to the bottom, this time not by accident, but by law. On coming to the surface, the drop gradually becomes heavier and sinks. Deep down, it loses weight and rises again. To float on the surface is good for it. To be deep down is bad. Much depends here on skill and on effort. In the second river, there are different currents, and it is necessary to get into the required current. The drop must float on the surface as long as possible in order to prepare itself to earn the possibility of passing into another current, and so on. But we are in the first river. As long as we are in this passive current, it will carry us wherever it may, 
As long as we are passive, we shall be pushed about and be at the mercy of every accident. We are the slaves of these accidents. At the same time, nature has given us the possibility of escaping from this slavery. Therefore, when we talk about freedom, we are talking precisely about crossing over into the other river. But of course, it is not so simple. You cannot cross over merely because you wish. Strong desire and long preparation are necessary. You will have to live through being identified with all the attractions in the first river. You must die to this river. All religions speak about this death. Unless you die, you cannot be born again. This this does not mean physical death. From that death, there is no necessity to rise again because if there is a soul and it is immortal, it can get along without the body, the loss of which we call death. And the reason for rising again is not in order to appear before the Lord God on the day of judgment, as the fathers of the church teach us. No, Christ and all the others spoke of the death which can take place in life, that death which is a necessary condition of the first and principal liberation of man. If a man were deprived of his illusions and all that prevents him from seeing reality, if he were deprived of his interests, his cares, his expectations and hopes, all his strivings would collapse. Everything would become empty, and there would remain an empty being, an empty body, only physiologically alive. This would be the death of I, the death of everything it consisted of, of the destruction of everything false, collected through ignorance or inexperience. All this will remain in him merely as material, but subject to selection. Then a man will be able to choose for himself and not have imposed on him what others like. He will have conscious choice. This is difficult. No, difficult is not the word. The word impossible is also wrong, because in principle it is possible. Only it is a thousand times more difficult than to become a multimillionaire through honest work. Question. There are two rivers. How can a drop go from the first to the second? Answer. It must buy a ticket. It is necessary to realize that only he can cross who has some real possibility of changing. This possibility depends on desire, strong wish of a very special kind, wishing with the essence, not with the personality. You must understand that it is very difficult to be sincere with yourself, and a man is very much afraid of seeing the truth. Sincerity is a function of conscience. Every man has a conscience. It is a property of normal human beings. But owing to civilization, this function has become crusted over and has ceased to work, except in special circumstances where the associations are very strong. Then it functions for a little time and disappears again. Such moments are due to strong shock, great sorrow, or insult. At these times, conscience unites personality and essence, which otherwise are altogether separate. This question about two rivers refers to essence, as all real things do. Your essence is permanent. Your personality is your education, your ideas, your beliefs, things caused by your environment. These you acquire and can lose. The object of these talks is to help you get something real. But now we cannot ask this question seriously. We must first ask, how can I prepare myself to ask this question? I suppose that something, that some understanding of your personality has led you to a certain dissatisfaction with your life as it is, and to the hope of finding something better. You hope that I will tell you something you do not know, which will show you the first step. Try to understand that what you usually call I is not I. There are many I's, and each I has a different wish. Try to verify this. You wish to change, but part of you has this wish. Which part of you has this wish? Many parts of you may want many things, but only one part is real. It will be very useful for you to try to be sincere with yourself. Sincerity is the key which will open the door through which you will see your separate parts, and you will see something quite new. You must go on trying to be sincere. Each day you put on a mask, and you must take it off little by little. It is very difficult 
to be sincere all at once. But if you try, you will improve gradually. When you can be sincere, I can show you or help you to see the things you are afraid of, and you will find what is necessary and useful for yourself. These values really can change. Your mind can change every day, but your essence stays as it is. Knowledge, being, and understanding can grow. So when you're ready, contact me. Remember, you can go to our website at wisdomthroughaction.org and contact me through there. I look forward to talking to you. See you next time here on SBN. 